history of the discovery and development of the EEG begins in 1874, when a pediatrician with a, for that time unheard of curiosity and interest in science, saw distinct variations in brain currents, increasing during sleep, and disappearing after death. His name was Richard Caton, and he used a reflecting galvanometer to project the waveforms on a wall. He published his findings in the British Medical Journal in 1875, but never followed his line of inquiry further, and pursued a career in politics instead. The subject of brain waves lay dormant until 1890, when three scientists with laboratories in Krakow, Vienna and Kharkov confirmed Caton's findings. Of these three, Adolf Beck deserves a special mention, while trying to localize the sensory modalities of the cerebral cortex using electrical and sensory stimulation he did not just find the evoked responses, but also the spontaneous fluctuations of the brain potentials. This in itself was a major breakthrough, but Beck also brought up the decrease in the amplitude of these potentials upon sensory stimulation, and a cessation in the fluctuations of the electrical waves as a consequence of the afferent stimulation. Beck was the first to describe two essential elements, the desynchronization in the electrical waves after stimulation, and the evoked potentials after sensory stimulation. Eighteen years later, in 1908, Vladimir Pravdichnominsky, a young scientist in Kiev, got his hands on an Eindhoven string galvanometer. He started to experiment with the equipment and discovered action currents, in the central nervous system of a frog and also spontaneous electric fluctuations, through non-invasive electric measuring, in a dog's brain. He proudly published the results of his research in two high-impact journals in 1913. He spent most of the rest of his life trying to evade persecution and certain death in Stalin's gulags. So far, no one had dared to measure the electric variations in a human brain, but in 1924, a brave psychiatrist from Jena did just that. Experimenting on himself, his son Klaus and other people, Hans Berger recorded the first human electroencephalograms, or EEG, and discovered that alpha rhythm, but filled with doubt, he postponed publishing his observations for five years. When he finally did publish his breakthrough results in Uber das Elektronkephalogram des Menschen, in 1929, he was ridiculed and laughed at, and his discovery was treated with a mix of disbelief and disdain. It would take another eight years before his findings were confirmed by two British scientists, Edgar Douglas Adrian, and his fellow researcher, Brian Matthews. By that time the Nazis were in power in Berger's country, and he was sidelined and unable to further his research. Hans Berger took his own life in 1941. Edgar Douglas Adrian and Brian Matthews did not just confirm Berger's findings, they also made other important discoveries on the subject of capturing nerve activity. These men were science superstars, Adrian had won the Nobel Prize in 1932, and Matthews was a brilliant engineer, who invented two important pieces of technology the Matthews oscillograph for capturing nerve activity, and the differential amplifier for high-gain low-noise recording of electrical activity in biological systems. Using this equipment they employed a visual flicker at various frequencies, that would induce alpha activity at that same frequency, and they also described the frequency following response of the EEG, which would form the basis of many available audiovisual entrainment applications. Meanwhile, in the United States, the first publication on EEG came from Herbert Jasper and Leonard Carmichael in 1935, soon followed by the work of a fabulously wealthy and highly intelligent man who was building his own state-of-the-art laboratory in Tuxedo Park, attracting great scientists like Einstein and Heisenberg. His name was Alfred Lee Loomis, and just like Berger, he experimented on his own son. He was interested in the sleep EEG and described sleep spindles for the very first time. This would later prove to be fundamental in understanding the working mechanism of SMR neurofeedback. When World War II began in 1939, he donated his EEG equipment to Helwell Davis's group at Harvard Medical School, 
and Loomis turned his attention to the development of technologies that would end the war, five years later. We owe these pioneers of the EEG a great deal. Without them, our knowledge of the brain would be severely limited. Learn more at brainclinics.com.